Today we're going to be talking about fluid flow. And so I've got all these pictures here. Um, this one here comes from NASCAR's website. The rest come from this website about fluid flow. If you're interested in it, it's really significant for car racing. They, uh, well, just to cover a few basic things that you see here, when you have a single car traveling through the air, you have a big high pressure region in front of the car, or here's a picture where it shows the big high pressure region. The air goes, of course, around to the sides and over the top, but it's got to use a lot of its power to overcome that air pressure. And in the back side, it has low pressure. So if you look at the car and you think of the pressure, you have high in front. for a car traveling that direction. And so we learned that pressure relates to force, specifically that force is equal to pressure multiplied by area. Notice there's no vector signs here, so it's not a dot product, it's multiplication. And so that means that I have a force going into the surface here that's the force front, force going like this that's the force rear. And the sum of the forces due to air is equal to, if this is my positive direction, the force rear minus the force front. Okay, seriously, it's, there we go. So that would be equal to the pressure low times area minus pressure high times area. Assuming the front and back have the same pressure, which is reasonably true, or same area, I mean. You have a net force due to air that's the area of the front and rear grills times the low pressure in the back minus the high pressure in the front. Since by definition, the high pressure is a higher number than the low pressure, that gives you a net force due to air that's to the rear. And so the force that is supplied from the ground to the tires because of the engine is working primarily to overcome that with the race car. Well, if you bring a second car up to it, that second car will remove the low pressure behind the front car and decrease, well, lower the low pressure, increase the low pressure behind the front car and decrease the high pressure in front of the second car. So now if you look at two cars together as one unit, you have the power of two engines and you still have the same high pressure in front, the same low pressure in the back, but very little in between. And so your resistance is the same as it was for one car essentially, but you have twice the power. If you have twice the power for the same resistance, what's that going to tell you? Putting it in terms of force, if you have twice the force, but the same resistance force, what's going to happen? You're going to accelerate. And now the resistance force is actually proportional to the speed squared. And so you'll accelerate up to a higher speed when you get back to a net force of zero. So you can travel at higher speed with the two cars together, what they call drafting because of the fluid dynamics, the flow of the air. And so I've got some other pictures to try to illustrate the flow of the air. Um, so here you see three cars drafting. Obviously, it's easier for them to travel fast. If you ever watch NASCAR racing, you'll see somebody who's like leading the race, and then somehow they get stuck between two lines and they just drop like a rock because those lines have much more power compared to the air resistance, and thus they can go a lot faster. Okay, so let's get into talking about fluid flow. The first thing we talk about is simply flow rate. Flow rate has two definitions, the volume flow rate and the mass flow rate. What's the difference in the two? Well, when I talked about the basic states of matter, I said that solids had a fixed shape and a fixed volume, and liquids had a fixed volume but a variable shape. Well, the truth is fluids can compress a little, and I mentioned that. And so the two are only different if you compress the fluid. If the fluid doesn't get compressed, if the density stays constant, the two are the same. 
So flow rate, we use the symbol Q for flow rate. And the volume flow rate is the volume of water that passes a certain point divided by time that it takes for it to pass. So if I define a point P here, and I say how much water passes that point T, P in time delta T, I can just say, well, the distance the water is going to travel is equal to the speed of the water multiplied by the time that I'm giving it to pass. So that's the distance of the water that passes. Volume, here we have for convenience a cylinder. The volume of cylinder is the distance or the height times the area. And so the volume is just going to be the area times the distance, which is area times the speed times the time. This new stylus, you see I got my new stylus, right? Now to erase, I have to turn the pen, the stylus over. And I'm so lazy, I don't flip it like this. I try to flip my wrist. I'm not very dexterous that way. So I've got to, got to learn to use this right. So it turns out the flow rate is just the area of your vessel, cross-sectional area. Cross-sectional area means if you slice it perpendicular to the fluid flow direction, multiply by the speed that the fluid is flowing through. So if I have a constrained pipe and I have fluid flowing through that pipe, if the pipe narrows and I have the same amount of fluid per second passing the same flow rate, then it's going to have to travel faster because it has less area. It actually makes perfect sense. Think about your body. Your body has the pump, the heart, and out of that pump, you have this big old arch of aorta, right? The aortic arch, you call it whatever you like. Now, we all know that from the aorta, we have more than one artery that comes off of that, right? But let's take just as an example and say, let's suppose the aorta just narrowed down to a smaller area. What's going to happen to the speed of the blood flowing through the aorta as you get to the smaller area? It's going to go faster. That's right. Erica gave me the, the thumbs up sign, which could have meant that I'm really doing well in the lecture today, but more likely meant that the speed goes up. So the speed's going to go up in the, in the artery as it narrows down. Now, you guys have probably talked about in biology class, how many people have not taken biology? I'm looking at Peter. Oh, wow, I've got four people. <laughs> so those four people have stayed. This, but in, everyone else has stayed biology. And you've learned things like, you know, what happens when you, you know, go into <coughs> the shock, right? You have the body's responses. And what happens to the blood vessels? Or the arteries here. What happens to the arteries when you have a shot? Shrink. They constrict. What my person who hasn't taken biology answered. They constrict. Well, when they constrict, <laughs> what's that gonna do the speed of the blood going through? No, it's gonna make it speed up if you have the same flow rate. Now we'll talk more about this because when I was taking my EMT class, my instructor got it backward and they said, isn't that right, Richard? And you know, it's really embarrassing when you have to tell them, um, no, <laughs> but yeah, we'll get to that. So we call the content continuity of flow, continuity of flow, the continuity equation. As long as you don't have an air gap or a vacuum or something, you have continuous flow, the flow rate is going to stay the same. Now, we're going to, well, let, let, let me do a simple problem just with this. Let's suppo suppose that you have a manifold that has, well,
three exits. Okay, this is not well drawn, but now it's better. <laughs> not quite as good as I wanted. There, has three exits. You have fluid flowing in with Q1, fluid flowing out with Q2, Q3, and Q4. What can you tell me about the flow rates using the continuity equation? Have no air gaps in there. It's just fluid flowing. Go ahead, Erica. Could it be that the same amount is just going faster because of the space it had? That is a true statement. I was going to go there after the answer I was looking for. A mathematical relationship between the flow rates. Yeah, the flow in should equal the flow out. Now, if we make an assumption that two, three, and four are all equivalent, that they're equal to each other, then we could say that Q1 is equal to 3Q2. So Q2 is going to have to be equal to Q1 divided by 3. Trace. Um, Q1 equals Q2 plus, oh, yes, instead of three and four. Thank you. So Q2, which is equal to Q3 and Q4, is one third of Q1. And then if we want to talk about the speeds, which was what Erika was talking about, then I have V2A2 is equal to v1 a1 over 3 and it's going to be faster because of the smaller areas if my picture is anywhere close to accurate but you'd have to actually know what the area areas are to get that answer we talk about this we use it kind of implicitly when we're doing problems we're like oh yeah it narrowed down so boom and just keep going so it's just a step in solving problems. We don't usually make problems that are simply dealing with the flow rate because it's a simple process. Now, Bernoulli's principle is something that you've all seen or heard about at some point. It's a big thing and it has a very simple outcome. And so I'm going to illustrate the outcome before I talk about it. And so that's why I have my hair dryer here. Yeah, don't have any hair, so. Here I have just a piece of paper. Really non-exciting. Hanging over the edge. It's about the Nobel Prize for uh, 2000, I don't know. Black hole formation growth. No, it's not about Nobel Prize. Okay, I turn on my air, and I blow it over the top. And what's happened to the paper when the air blows over the top? The air blowing over the top pulled it up. Now, you can't pull it up, technically speaking. But if it came up, what was acting on the paper to make it move? Pressure. We had air pressure putting a force on the top and air pressure putting a force on the bottom. Now, the air underneath was simply atmospheric pressure. But the air on the top was moving. And Bernoulli's relation says that when the air is moving, the pressure drops. And so there was a lower pressure on top, a higher pressure on bottom. So the net force, the pressure on bottom times the area on bottom, minus the pressure on top times the area on top, pushed it up. So the air on the bottom pushed it up because the air on top wasn't pushing down as hard. Now that brings up another thing. I always like to say, when you're drinking from a straw, well, let's start with this. When you're drinking from a straw, let's, let's suppose you have yourself a tasty soda pop. 
and your soda pop is for some reason blue, and you have the straw that you're drinking from. So you put your lips on there and you suck away. So you're sucking on the straw. And of course, as you suck in the straw, we all know the water comes up or the, the soda comes up. And so you're able to drink through a straw. And we all like drinking. I believe we may not all like drinking through a straw. We are kids, we love to. What is making the soda come up the straw? Okay, it's pressure. Oftentimes people will say, oh, I sucked it up. But you can't suck. You can only lower the pressure and the atmospheric pressure pushes it into your mouth. If you look at this, you have, let's suppose that this entire straw is now filled with water. So the whole thing's filled with water. And so if you treat that water as a parcel, on the bottom you have an upward force. That's not the color I wanted. Force up equals pressure of the bottom times the area of the straw. And on the top you have the force down equals the pressure in the mouth times the area. And finally you have the force of gravity is equal to area times height times density times G. Why area times height times density times G? Because area times height is the volume of the water in click in, inside of the straw. Rho is the density of water and G is acceleration of gravity. So that's my net force in that column of water. If the column of water is going to go upward, then I'm going to have to have a slightly larger upward force than my downward force. So the net force is slightly up to give that acceleration upward. So to start it coming up, you have to have a greater upward force than downward force. Your mouth is pushing down because the pressure inside your mouth, shockingly, is not that much different than atmospheric pressure, right? You don't get to a vacuum. A vacuum is zero pressure. Remember, you can't go lower than zero pressure. So you're not at a vacuum, but you have pressure atmosphere out here. You go down and you have delta P to get to the bottom. Delta P is equal to rho GH. And I, I'm going to, instead of H, I'm going to put D for depth. And so the pressure down there is pressure atmosphere plus density of water times G times the depth of straws in the water. And then the pressure on top is what you're putting on there. And as you lower the pressure on top, the force of the pressure of the water down the bottom pushes the soda up the straw. And if you lower the pressure just a little, it only comes up a little in the straw until you reach the balanced situation. Lower the pressure, more will come up higher. Lower it enough, and it will rise into your mouth and you can drink. So drinking with a straw is a simple application of this fluid flow. Go ahead. Like pushing it down and pull it up. You, you okay? You can't have a negative pressure. Pressure can never be negative. It can go down to a vacuum of zero. Remember when we talked about like the barometer? At the top, it just has a pressure of zero. You can't lower any more. Can't draw it up with a vacuum pump any more than what's well. If you have zero on top, it can rise up to where the bottom is at atmospheric pressure. Now with Bernoulli's principle, we're going to talk about flow rate and how that affects pressure. I came to this because it reminded me. If you have two truck or a truck and a car traveling next to each other, the air going between them is constrained, constrained to a small region and actually is going at a faster speed. When you look at diagrams like this, the separation between the lines is inversely proportional to the speed. So when the lines are closer, it's going faster. When they're farther away, it's going slower. So that's how to read those lines. So you have a faster speed in between the cars. If the air is going faster 
between, according to Bernoulli's relation, what's happening to the pressure? It's going down. And so the car is going to be pulled into the truck. Now, that doesn't sound very good, does it? No. No, it isn't. As a matter of fact, when I was <clears throat> working at the uh, Bethel Pacific Northwest Laboratory, we had to have safety lectures every month. The government required it because it was a government lab. And it didn't matter what those safety lectures were. So the principal investigators, they were just rotated. Somebody had to get in a safety person. And so I went to a safety lecture on train safety, which was hilarious in that the person that came from like Santa Fe Railroad or something, they were serious as a heart attack. And you have all these scientists who are like, I have to waste my time here. This is useless. And we're very, uh, yeah, not, not complimentary. But the person showed us all these videos of people getting hit by trains. <laughs> because she wanted to make sure that all these people with PhDs in physics and biology and chemistry knew that you shouldn't step in front of a train. Now, typical things that happen, there's a train track right here. And somebody's sitting here on the phone standing like six inches from the train track. And the train comes, and all of a sudden they, boom, go into the train and bounce off and maybe live. Why did they jump into the train? Were they suicidal? No. Why did they jump into the train? The train coming by is going really fast. And there's air that's pulled by the train, so you have fast air on the side of you that's close to the train, slower air on the other side, lower pressure on the train side, higher pressure on the outside, you got pushed in. Right? The person wasn't paying attention, they weren't racing themselves, they got pushed by air, then they hit the train. Right, so that's why, the big reason why, you're supposed to stand like a meter back from the train, so that pressure difference doesn't push you into the train. We can all be pretty sure that you're not going to intentionally lean in to the train, <coughs> but if you're not paying attention, you could get pushed in, not by a person, but by the air. <laughs> yes, train safety lecture. I've been there. So what is Bernoulli's relation? Bernoulli's relation is the relationship between pressure and speed and elevation and so we get an equation from Bernoulli's relation by using an energy balance so we take a situation where we have a pipe that changes area changes elevation from here to there and we say the work done has to be equal to the change in energy and so doing that equation, the work done is going to be equal to work one plus work two, right? Where we have one and two, one is on the left side, two is on the right side. We have one parcel of water that you see in green. And we're going to have different distances that move because of the different diameters. So I'm going to say, well, work one is equal to pressure one times area one, that's force one times distance one so there's force two in parentheses I do have to pay attention to directions I said work one plus work two correct but then in my next line I have a sign missing because work is force times distance in what direction Work is force times distance parallel. And so if we look at the bottom where it says pressure one, it's going to move in the direction of pressure one according to my picture. So this one is going to be positive. Pressure one, area one is the same direction as distance one. On the top, it moves the opposite direction. And so and actually my picture has X1 and X2. So I'm going to change my symbols to match the picture. But for the top, for location two, the force is to your left, the distance is to your right. Those are opposites. There's a negative sign for that work. So there's my work. 
Now, according to the work energy relationship, what is the net work equal to? I know it's been a couple of weeks, but you did just have an exam on this. Okay, work net is force times distance. That's correct, but I was looking for the work energy relation. That's correct. Thank you for answering correctly. Yeah, work net is change in kinetic energy plus change in potential energy. So that's going to be, hmm. One half mass times V2 squared minus one half mass times V1 squared. Oh, what is the mass? I put the same mass, well, because it is the same mass. But how do we calculate that mass? The mass here and the mass here are going to be the same. Mass 1 equals mass 2. Mass is going to be density times volume 1. So all of those are expressions of the mass. So in keeping with my symbols, I'm going to rewrite this as, well, yeah, one half density A1, X1, whoops, A2, X2, forgot which one was which. V2 squared minus one half density area one X one V one squared. So that's the change in kinetic energy part. Now for the change in potential energy part, my potential energy is mass times G times height. So using the same equations for mass and G and height, That's rho A2, X2, H2 minus rho A1, X1, rho 1. So now if I look at my relationship here, I can put everything together and have a long, long stinking equation. And that long stinking equation is, I'm sorry, I can't remember. P1, A1, X1 minus P2, A2, X2 equals one half density. A2, X2, V2 squared minus one half density A1, X1, V1 squared <coughs> plus density A2, X2, H2 minus density A1, X1, H1. Now that's a long equation. I have to shrink down the page to show it all on one screen. I have A1X1 or A2X2 everywhere in my equation. Well, this is a good thing. The last thing I'm going to use here is the continuity relationship. The continuity relationship says that A1V1 is equal to a2 v2 if i multiply both sides by delta t v1 delta t is x1 and v2 delta t is x2 which means that i can cancel the ax from each term and finally I have the Bernoulli equation. 
P1 minus P2 equals one half rho V2 squared minus one half rho V1 squared plus rho H. Um, oh, Richard forgot a G. Richard forgot a G starting here. Now we usually move the subscripts all to the same side. So we usually write this as P1 plus one half rho V1 squared plus rho G H1 is equal to P2 plus one half rho V2 squared plus rho G H2. That's usually what we write for the Bernoulli equation. What is important about this equation? I went through the derivation because I think it's important to know there is a not difficult way that this is derived. It's not straightforward, but it's not difficult. We just applied conservation, well, the work energy relation. We had to calculate the work, we had to calculate kinetic energy, we had to calculate the potential energy, and then we had to use the continuity relation to get the Bernoulli equation. But what this says is if I have a constrained fluid, constrained, you don't have any bubbles in the air gas or anything, that the pressure plus one half rho V squared plus rho GH is going to be constant anywhere in that constrained fluid. So if the pressure goes up and the height stays the same, then the speed is going to have to drop. If the height goes up and the speed stays the same, then the pressure is going to drop and so on. So it gives us a relationship between our variables of pressure, speed, and elevation. Now, first clicker question. What method is used to derive Bernoulli's equation? In other words, what did I just do? And I'm logged into the app, but I don't know how to sign into your class. It's um, I'm, it's WebFizz. I'm not sure so, where to have descriptions, and then it talk. It has my mobile ID. But it doesn't let me click anything. I don't get to do this because, of course, respond. Session ID web is. It does, yeah. I think I lost it on camera or something, so I walked out. I was like, okay, yeah. now you have to put your information. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. We had all but one person got it right, so I'm not gonna belabor this. I used the work energy relation, right? The Bernoulli equation is simply a result of that work energy relation. Here's some examples of the Bernoulli relation. In your, uh, your furnace in your house, you have natural gas flowing, and it's aspirated. It has air that comes in because you know what happens if you try to light just the natural gas? Nothing. It won't burn. You need an oxidizer with the fuel. Oxidation, heat, and fuel are the three sides of the triangle of fire. And so you have that hole for air to come in. And you, you start to worry like, but that's a hole in my gas line, isn't it? But if you have the gas flowing through, it's lower pressure and it pulls air in. If you have a blockage, if something blocks it up here, then you have a problem. Or, yeah, you know, we all go to the store and we've got to, okay, I'm joking, of course, get that little perfume with the atomizer and go, and then you walk into it. I've seen that on TV at the very least. I don't do that myself. Well, that is using the Bernoulli relation. You blow, you know, that little thing here is just blowing air through a tube. 
but there's a hole in that tube that goes down into the perfume. And when the air flows over, pressure is lower. The atmospheric pressure in the perfume bottle pushes perfume up into that stream of air and you get perfume coming out. Or in chemistry lab, you guys use these in chemistry lab, right? Okay, people who took chemistry use this in chemistry lab, right? You have water, you turn on the water in the sink and then you put your little tube to the little aspirator thing on the sink and now you have something to suck. Why? Because that water moving means you have a lower pressure in the water and air pressure then, the air gets pushed in by air pressure, lowers the pressure. Um, the last one here is a water heater vent. I, of course, wondered why is the vent not sealed? And it's not sealed because the outer portion, the inner portion is sealed. The outer portion is an air jacket so that you have some insulation so it's not so hot on the roof. And because it's, you know, because of the flow there, you pull that cool air. Actually, I think it's, I don't know. I think it's sealed. Could be wrong. Or the most important ones to me, airplane wings and sailboats. Yes, in college, I took the sailing PE class. I still remember one of the questions on our exam, our one and only exam was, what is a boat? And the answer that we were supposed to select was a hole in the water that you throw infinite amounts of money into. Yes, I do remember that. <laughs> but how does an airplane work? Well, an airplane flies because of this Bernoulli relation. You have a wing, and that wing is designed to split the air and make the air travel faster over the top surface than on the bottom surface. And so if you have, let's say, a 10% faster speed on the top than the bottom, then when you calculate the net force on the wing, you know, just saying that V top is equal to V bottom times 1.10, 10% increase. Then if I calculate the force on the wing, that's going to be the pressure bottom times the area minus the pressure top times the area. And according to the Bernoulli relation, the height difference of the wing is negligible. So I'm going to say H top equals H bottom. And according to the Bernoulli relationship, then Um, got them in the wrong order. Now, one thing that's important, many times I've seen students write speed of the top, my speed, of the bottom parenthesis, and then square that quantity. You have to do the speed top squared minus the speed bottom squared, or it's a completely different answer. And so if I put in the speed difference I was getting, given, not getting, this color is now annoying me. If I do that, notice the V bottom I can factor out. And it'd be 1.1 squared is 1.21. And so that's what I would have for the upward force. Notice that 10% increase in speed results in a 21% increase in the upward force and the lift as we call it. And then it depends on the area of the wing. So an area, a wing with a bigger area is gonna have more lift. 
Depend, depends on how fast the airplane is going. If the airplane is going faster, it's going to have more lift. And it depends on the density of air. Right? If the air is more dense, you're going to have more lift. So, yeah, no one was in the drone class with me last year, but one of the things we had to learn for a pilot's exam was about the outcomes of this relationship. Sadly, you didn't have to use Bernoulli relationship or anything like that, but that's how you calculate the lift for an airplane. So airplanes will have you know wings that you can extend when you land. Why would you extend it when you land? Well, not because it slows you down, because you're going slower. And so this factor here goes down when you land. But we need to have the lift, the upward force, equal to the gravitational force downward. So if you slow down and your lift drops, you need something else to increase the lift so you don't fall out of the sky. We call it a wing stall if you go so slow that the lift is smaller than the downward force of gravity. And then you just fall to the ground. Not fun. And so the area, they extend those flaps to increase the area so that they'll still have enough lift. They can slow down and keep it in the air and not crash. We like that, right? All fans of not crashing. So that's an example of an airplane wing. Well, what about a sailboat? When I was in graduate school, I kid you not, this physics major who was a member of Mensa was absolutely convinced that a sailboat can never sail faster than the airspeed. And, you know, at first glance, that seems reasonable because, you know, you think of something like a kite. When you're flying that kite, kite air is pushing on it. And the air will keep pushing on it unless you let it go the same speed as the air. Then it's going the same speed as the air, it's pushing the same on both sides. Yeah, no more fun. That is how boats used to be made. Back in the days of the, you know, Viking warships, that's what they did. They put up a sail and they just caught the wind and went the direction the wind blew, essentially. You know, you have a rudder and stuff to try to affect that, but that's, so they couldn't go faster than the speed of the air. But with today's boats, with today's sailboats, you have a sail that will deform with the wind. And, you know, in that sailing class, they taught us to, you know, trim the sail. You got to sheet in until it stops luffing. Right? Everybody know these terms? Luffing is when it's flapping in the air. Right? So you pull it in so it stops flapping and it forms this nice curved shape that you see in the sail. And you actually form a pocket of pretty dead air here. So you have a pocket here of dead air, stationary air. If that's stationary air, what's the pressure going to be? going to be whatever atmospheric pressure is because you go far enough away right <laughs> atmospheric pressure on the other side because it's bowed out the air is traveling faster and you can see by the separation of the lines again that the air is traveling faster on the front side if it's traveling faster according to the Bernoulli relation the pressure goes down and so you have a greater pressure on the back side than on the front side hence a net force pushing it what direction is the net force on this sail? <laughs> Hot tip, it's not forward. What direction is the net force? Not backward either. The net force is like that. Well, to get the boat sailing faster, what direction would you want the net force to be? You want it to be more forward. So the sailboat can actually go faster when the wind is coming across it than when it's coming from directly behind. Now you don't want straight across and depending on the type of sailboat is different angles that gives you the fastest speed, but your direction of the net force differs. Now, if that's all you had going, if there are no other forces horizontally on the boat, what direction would the boat accelerate? The net force is up and to the left. What direction would it accelerate? It would accelerate up and to the left. It would accelerate in the direction of the net force. So what we need is we need to add some additional forces. Well, one force you can't control. 
the drag force. The water is a significant force slowing you down in the sailboat, right? But you would still drift sideways with that drag force. And so you also put in a keel or in the sailboats we use for my sailing class, just a dagger board, a big board that you shove down through the center of the hull. And that then allows the water to provide a force like this. And so if you look at the forces on the sailboat, you have the force for the sail like this, and you have the force for the keel like this, and then you're going to have the force drag like this opposing the motion. The bigger the two green add up to, the faster it can go because that drag force is going to vary with speed. And so if you make the green parts bigger, then the drag force is going to have to vary, which means you go faster. One more thing to consider with the sailboat, if you look at the sailboat from the side, so here's the sailboat, here's my keel, <coughs> keel, not like Eddie Murphy saying, keel my landlord. Does anybody actually recognize that reference? Saturday Night Live thing with convicts doing poetry? Dark night. Anyway, Q Malandler. Q Malandler. He spells it C I L L, my landlord. Um, anyway, you have that force in the keel. You have the force from the wind on the sail. Here's our, our sails like that. Force the wind like that. What's the sailboat naturally going to do? What happens if I just push with my fingers and not hold the pin? It rotates, right? Because the net torque is not zero. So you have a problem with the tail sailboat flipping over. So you have to do things to try to combat that as well. So what things you do? Well, what we love to do in sailing class is we hike. We get a rope and we have that rope tied to us and we're standing out here pulling on it, hanging over the edge. Totally fun. We love to do that. We loved it so much that we would have one person hike on this side so we could have the other two going out extreme on the other side. So you do that to counter the torque. Another thing that they do in boats is they will put like spent uranium. Why spent uranium? Why not lead? Well, uranium is a lot more dense than lead. Put that spent uranium down here in the keel to make it really massive. So as it tips, this starts to rise and the force of gravity provides a counter torque. So sailboats, airplanes, great examples of using that Bernoulli principle. The last thing I'm going to talk about here is the pitot tube or Randall tube. You might notice this on the side of an airplane, the little thing that sticks out. It measures the airspeed. It has a hole in front. And surprisingly, the air in that hole in front is stationary. And so the pressure there is atmospheric pressure because the air is stationary. But then you have a hole on the side, and there the air is traveling at the speed of the airplane which means that you have a lower pressure because of the speed of the airplane. And then you just have inside a tube of fluid and you measure the height difference in that tube of fluid, what we call a manometer. And the pressure difference is one half density times the speed of air squared. One half density of air times speed of air squared. And the height difference is the pressure difference times G. Well, excuse me, the pressure difference is G times density of the fluid times the height difference. And so you can relate the pressure difference to the height that travels and to the speed. And hence, you can calculate the airspeed from that device. And 